I'm Jen Taylor Skinner, and this is The Electorate. On this episode, I have a conversation with Jackie Singh. Jackie is a cybersecurity expert who worked as a threat analyst for President Biden's campaign. And she recently founded a very popular and very illuminating newsletter called Hacking But Legal. I followed Jackie online for a while now. And her social media posts about online privacy and cyber crimes are really insightful and eye-opening. So I was so excited to finally sit down with Jackie and ask her all the questions, specifically about the hidden risks we all take as cyber citizens, a topic very few people seem to be talking about, especially in the context of how this shapes our political discourse. Jackie and I talk about Americans under surveillance and how data that's being collected under that surveillance is being used. We also talk about lax privacy laws, PSYOPs campaigns, nefarious foreign influence campaigns. And finally, we talk about the best way to navigate the cyber landscape during one of the most important election cycles of this country's recent history. So I hope you enjoy my conversation with Jackie Singh. Jackie Singh, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to delve into the wild and crazy topics that I'm sure we're going to come across today. <laughs> yeah, excited. Yeah, it, it is an exciting conversation, right? Um, would we rather have it another way, of course? But I want to talk to you about the ways in which Americans are being surveilled. And I think that the level of surveillance that the average person is under in America on any given day, right, is probably greater than we all realize. Some ways are obvious, like if you're in a mall or in a bank or in an elevator, you can see that there are cameras, but there are probably more insidious ways, hidden ways we're being surveilled that I'm hoping that you'll point out in this conversation. If I just think about my typical day, we have Alexa devices throughout the house. We kind of use it as an intercom system. You know, it wakes me up in the morning, the alarm, it tells me the weather. <laughs> You know, we have Apple devices, iPads, iPhones, watches, everything's connected. It's connected to my car. It's connected to, you know, the thermostat. Everything's connected. So how much surveillance am I under just generally or the average person? And how much should I worry about that? Well, I was working at the Surveillance Technology Oversight Project as a director and engaging in a research project in which Albert Fox Kahn, who founded the organization to litigate and advocate against systems of surveillance, particularly the government's use of said systems and data. I was able to look online for cameras that were presenting themselves to the internet using an IP address. And what I found was quite shocking for me personally, in the sense that there is a surveillance iceberg that we all kind of live with, where the majority of the surveillance that we are aware of kind of is above that little bit of the iceberg that pokes up above the water. And the bits that we don't know about actually form the larger kind of compendium of surveillance systems and devices that exist and that are aimed at us without, you know, necessarily our knowledge or, you know, certainly not our consent. And so during the course of this research project, I was able to identify 17,000 in my immediate recollection the number was a little bit higher than that, I think, 17,000 or so devices across the five boroughs of New York City with concentrations in particular zip codes. And so just identifying one brand of camera, which is really important to note that those 17,000 devices all came from the world's largest surveillance manufacturer, Hikvision, um, it really shocked me. You know, we, we drive past the automated license plate reader on our way through the school zone. We are in a world where security cameras have become very commonplace. And so your neighbors have nest devices or ring cameras, right? That are capturing movement to and from, you know, your apartment or your home, right? You're walking your dog down the street, your neighbor's surveillance devices are capturing that movement. And we could go a bit further with that away from say the concept of government collecting information to the sense that corporations are gathering information and they're using regular people like you and I to gather that information. For example, if you have an Apple device, it is almost certain that your device uses the UWB, the ultra low power Bluetooth module inside your phone in order to communicate and engage with the Apple network in order for people to find their lost devices, to find air tags or to just to use air tags. In fact, that's how the system works. Everyone is essentially enrolled by default into this program that shares information about the whereabouts of devices that simply moved past you, that came into 
contact range, right? And with a network range of, of you unbeknownst to you. And so it's not just a sense that governments are collecting a lot of data and doing things with that data and even buying data from data brokers that they didn't capture themselves, but that everyone is being turned into a sort of sensor because we carry so many devices with us and all of those devices are connected. So it's really hard to say, um, you know, what type of surveillance regime you're actually under because our policies in the United States specifically pretty much allow it to be a bit of a free for all. As long as you click that terms and conditions and you affirmatively consent to whatever is in that big block of text, we're considered to have gone through a consent process. We're considered to be legally absolved, say as a corporation, legally absolved from the collection of that data, right? And I think there are a lot of assumptions that get built in there that aren't really considered because we're trained to just click the T's and C's and to agree to them so that we can use products, so that we can do things. We don't necessarily have the expertise to understand how those T's and C's are being presented to us and what it actually means to install a new app on our, on our devices, whether that's a laptop or a phone, what are the implications of adding a new connected device to my household, and what does it mean for all of these devices to all be in contact with each other? Who actually has that data, and what are the implications for us individually and for all of us? I mean, these are all really open questions, Jen, that we aren't quite sure of together as a society. Um, firstly, do we actually have a choice? Because if you don't click terms and conditions, you're kind of cut out of a world of connection with your fellow citizens, right? You can't pay for things in some places if you don't have a device that's, that isn't connected. Like, you know, do we really have a choice with terms and conditions? I don't think we do. That's what I was alluding to when I talk about consent, when I spoke about consent. I don't think that we are in a world where the presentation of terms and conditions is anything else other than a dark pattern intended to get us to click, right? The way that apps present us with this information is to cover their butts, to get us to scroll to the end, and then to click our rights away, right? Now you're in an arbitration situation if they wrong you and you're, you're able to somehow, as an individual, which is very, very difficult in 2024, to prove that there was some wrong or harm that was done against you collective action in that situation. You have to get a congressman or a senator to take interest in your case and care about it because the tech companies are simply so powerful, right? Where they've amassed a base of power, not just in Silicon Valley, but in Washington, where they lobby to their heart's content. And we see a lot of hearings relating to issues that we're having on social media and with tech companies more broadly, but not necessarily seeing positive outcomes or policy results that are affecting us in a positive way as outcomes from those hearings, right? But I think increasing awareness is valuable no matter what. Right. You know, about those hearings, I've, I've talked about those over the years. And every time I'm a, I'm a tech person too, or a former tech person, right? Every time I watch those hearings and you probably see the same thing, it's apparent that, you know, they're not even close to being tech savvy enough to know where to go with these conversations, let alone the legislation that needs to happen to control the amount of surveillance that we're under, right? The average person just doesn't have that knowledge and that's a problem and I don't know how to solve it. On both sides, Jen, both as a practitioner of surveillance, which many people in the world of cybersecurity do not necessarily realize that that's the business that they're in, in order to understand what is occurring, one must have visibility into what is occurring. One must characterize events and activity as either safe or potentially unsafe and then develop a process for dealing with that. So cybersecurity operators, especially at the larger companies that are processing bulk amounts of Americans' data and of data of global citizens, right, of people from other countries, we don't really have a lot of safeguards on that. And we don't have a lot of thought as to ethics. It's simply we're cybersecurity professionals, we work in this business, we're doing the right thing. But what we're starting to see is that the infrastructure inside these companies that is created for the purpose of cybersecurity can sometimes be leveraged for other purposes inside the company, other ideas that the company has about how to protect itself that may have originated with the legal department or with the risk department, right? So the, the simple act of collecting data in the very first place is actually what causes or enables, or not, not causes directly, but enables those secondary and tertiary harms that come as a result of the data being collected in the first place. And we often don't connect what happened all the way at the end of that chain, at the end of the harm chain, 
with the original data collection. So as a cybersecurity professional, it's been really fascinating for me to engage in conversations with my colleagues where, you know, just my industry colleagues, they don't really seem to grasp the sense that the increased visibility that they have as a result of their roles and the increased privilege that they have, right, from a computer perspective, privilege means being an administrator or having some higher than average visibility and access into accounts. There's not really a sense that that can be abused. We're just not there yet. And so I think over time, it will be more apparent to more of us that people who centralize data sets can derive value from that. Today, it isn't super well understood. There are a lot of people who are using these dossiers of us that they pass around just for marketing purposes. And the majority of the dossiers on all of us individually are passed around, bought and sold for marketing purposes. So companies can figure out how they can target us just that much better. But what's happening because of this really low policy and low regulatory environment that we find ourselves in is that there are all kinds of things that can be done with our data that we never asked for, that we never consented to, that had no relationship to the original use of the data. And it's very unlikely that anyone will get in trouble for that. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's just kind of a free for all. Yeah. I mean, I guess I've always taken the stance and I, and I know that it's a naive stance that, you know, it's fine. You know, I'm tech savvy. I know that I'm under some surveillance, but I'm not doing anything wrong. I'm pretty boring. <laughs> right. So surveil me. I think that's how the the majority of us feel, you know, we're just kind of like, but how does this affect me? And realistically in cybersecurity, I've seen this again and again, where people, companies, uh, even nonprofit organizations, even people who are activists, people who are politicians and heavily targeted, they may not want to take the security recommendations that you give them because they are simply unable to connect you know, th- I, mean, I do this thing and it may impact my privacy here. I do this thing and it impacts my security posture here. There isn't a sense of how do I innately threat model myself the same way that I would if I owned an apartment and then I would lock the door every time I come in the door because I have an innate understanding of what the possible risk is there. But because regular folks, and I say regular folks to mean 99.9999% of the planet that aren't cybersecurity people or people who work in these fields that involve a heavy amount of data collection and analysis, they aren't aware of the threat. They aren't quite sure what's happening behind the scenes and are, and are finding it really difficult to connect. This company is collecting data about me and X, Y, and Z bad things may happen. This is just an aside. I was thinking that it took me a really long time to get onto Facebook and any social media platforms because at the time I was actually actively working in technology. I've, I've since left, but I saw, you know, how careless professionals can be with that data. And I never wanted to be a part of that system, <laughs> but it took me a really long time. So that's just an aside. So I know that there are some harms. Most of them are kind of hidden and invisible, but then there's just some like careless use and protection of your data. You know, these people who are in charge of your data, they're just regular folks, you know, and they have flaws like the rest of us. And I'll just, you know, just, just leave that aside. But as far as data privacy laws, I believe that in comparison to other countries that have comparable levels of technological use, they have better laws than we have. And when you think about technology, For it to work well, it has to move quickly, you know, move fast and break things. But government and legislation, they move very slowly. It moves very slowly. So having laws that catch up to the speed at which technology moves, it it just seems like an impossible problem to solve. And I think that obviously technological advancements have outpaced our data privacy laws. Is that true? You know, how are other countries pulling this off when we can't? I don't think other countries are truly pulling it off. I think a few countries are aware of the threat and consider it to be paramount to their national security, like say Germany, whereas the United States is too busy profiting from the from the lax data privacy regime in order to put some safeguards on it. And we could say the same about say crypto, right? Like cryptocurrencies, another regulatory and policy hot potato that doesn't seem to advance. And it's a lot of conversation about what do we do I think that part of the problem is the cybersecurity professionals tend to congregate towards the companies that pay them the most. And so there isn't a ton of incentive when you're, you know, a freshly minted grad coming out of, um, you know, getting your bachelor's degree or getting your master's in cyber, like my cousin just did. 
there isn't a whole lot of incentive to want to work for the federal government unless you say already, uh, you know, you have a veteran status or you've, you've got family members that work for the government. So I think that we're not properly incentivizing people. We're not keeping pace with the hiring structures that exist at private corporations. I mean, there just isn't any way for the federal government to be as bureaucratically agile and, and un, unbureaucratically flexible and agile as some of these big companies that are really looking to pick up key talent. And so one of the major problems I think the federal government has overall is just talent, is, is having the right people there who can advise on the issues and then prioritizing lobbyists over academics and people who truly understand these issues is always going to result in a skewed outcome that isn't necessarily representative of the needs of the American people. So we have a lot of people who who show up with, with policy ideas, like uh, let's say Sam Altman, right? Sam Altman did a trip to Washington. It was a bit like a media blitz. He saw a lot of people. He was talking to a lot of politicians and I think that we fall short when we think that a CEO is someone who has best interests in mind of people, as opposed to having the best interests of their shareholders as, as number one. And I don't think that anyone whose primary interest are shareholders and not people should be performing advisory services and doing this extended kind of contact with many different people in our government in a way that's totally disproportionate to the way that people who truly work in these fields who have the expertise to bring to bear and can give really solid policy recommendations, give the input to our government that is necessary and needed, those people aren't at the table so often. And when they do get brought to the table, it isn't always in a demographically representative uh, fashion as you know, matching the American people, let's say. Right. If they did have those same concerns, then they wouldn't be in the profession that they're in. They'd be on the other side of the table. They'd be representatives, right? Like, that's the whole point, <laughs> right? They know where the money is, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. That's yeah. really interesting. So instead, instead, we got, you know, uh, Mr. Altman um, just kind of presenting his view and his perspective on his technology which he considers to be world changing and has a narrative for how he wants to promote that, which was developed not just by himself, but presumably by his team of people who are experts at PR and marketing and legal and risk and strategy and all of the different pieces that you need in order to run a very successful startup. And so I think that our electeds are often listening to some of the wrong people and as a result, their priorities are getting skewed often in the wrong direction or in a less effective direction than they could be. Right, right. You would think that they would have learned that lesson following the 2016 election, right? But alas, you know, here we are. Alas. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I want to talk about some of the hidden risks to individuals, right? Can you tell us, you know, what harms are happening just to the average person every day. And then we'll move on to national security risks, but just the individual. Yes. I wrote an article about a concept that I'm calling SAP, S-A-A-P-P. -P. I wanted to drive a new concept or label a concept that's driven by activities and behaviors that I've seen growing on the internet and very specifically growing on Twitter since the takeover of Elon Musk. And what they are are strategic attacks against public participation, S-A-A-P-P. -P. In the world of law, they have S-L-A-P-P, -P, which is a convention coded into law that prevents regular folks from getting into trouble for having discussions publicly or with their communities about people who are public figures. Right. And so there are laws that help protect citizens so that they can engage in their First Amendment protected speech. What we don't have is an understanding that there are individuals who are paying troll farms and reputation management companies that often work on PR support or like em emergency PR help for people who are in some kind of a situation that involves public recognition, right? Some kind of a crisis communications type of role. And these firms are often engaging in these strategic attacks against public participation. So what they do is they're hired to target an individual or organization or person who is opposed in some way to their business or their activities. And this often comes in the form of an activist or a journalist. 
And then what they do is they engage in very targeted harassment in order to get that person to stop. And it, it really seems clear that they engage in some level of psychological profiling. They look at everything you've ever said and done. And then they follow you online and look for ways to take down your, your drive, your confidence, your reputation, any type of statement that they can make or action that they can make, whether that's sending you a private DM, replying to you, replying to other people, uh, DMing individuals that you've had a public conversation with, anyone who supports you, right? And they look for ways to say, this person isn't okay. This person isn't safe. They're, um, they're an awful person. You know, think Hunter Biden, right? All of this stuff that happened with Hunter Biden and continues to happen with Hunter Biden is absolutely a strategic attack against public participation for him, which in my opinion was successful because it kept him out of the public eye for so many years. He, he didn't defend himself until very recently. And I think the, the idea was, let me just kind of hunker down and see if I can, if I can wait until this blows over. But what it does is it, it creates a scenario where they can exploit the information again and again, anytime that it becomes interesting for some reason, let's say a community on rumble, right? Some conservative activists on rumble find some information about Hunter Biden and decide to get it trending virally that day. It just becomes another opportunity for them to re-elevate the conversation and bring it up again and again. So after listening to Hunter, I do think that he's been attacked in a way that is unique to individuals in the public eye during this internet age, in the digital age, that is aided and abetted by organizations that are supposed to have some level of protection for us. So key point, Twitter with their trust and safety team, which was let go and replaced with a shell of its former self, as I understand it. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's happened to you, right? <laughs> to some extent. Yeah. I don't know if you want to talk about that, but is, is that what's happening? Yeah, I, sh I sure can. Okay, okay, sure. <laughs> please, please do. I, I do like to use this example because in 2020, I was like taking on the biggest role of my life. I was uh, offered a role on the Biden campaign to come on board as the senior incident responder and threat analyst over the moon. So happy to have an opportunity to help and to apply my skills to a cause that I felt really, really mattered. Um, I was two months postpartum at the time when I accepted the, the role um, with my second daughter. And it was just, it was just a really incredible time for me until I spoke with my leadership and did all the things that we needed to do in order for me to be able to come forward and be public about this. I wanted to inspire. I thought that as a, a quote unquote woman of color, right, that I'd be able to provide some inspiration for a lot of different people who might look like me or not look like me, but feel some kind of kinship based on our mutual diversity, right? Um, I'm half Dominican, half Indian. My mother's from the Dominican Republic. My father's from India. They're both naturalized citizens to the United States. And I was born in New York. So I've always been in a very multicultural and diverse milieu, which has not been the case for the world of cybersecurity. You know, like hacking and cybersecurity are very heavily skewing white and male. So it, it was really shocking for me as someone who had never had that kind of uh, political association uh, despite all of the very active activism and conversations I'd had over the years talking about sexism in the cybersecurity industry, racism, uh, I had a lot of tweets about Antifa, right? Like, come on, they're trying to fool us about Antifa. This isn't really right, a right. thing. <laughs> this isn't really a thing. <laughs> and so I, 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 I cleaned up my profile. I thought I don't want any tweets on here to be, you know, embarrassing Joe because, you know, I, at one point I did have that I was the chief information security officer yeah. at Antifa. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's was, it was not a real organization. It was a tongue in cheek joke, but there are a lot of people who don't necessarily understand the nuances behind this stuff who hadn't been following me for a while. And so I cleaned up my profile. We, we talked about it at work. I said, okay, let's do it. And I announced it. And the week that I announced it, it turned into a doxing incident. It turned into FBI in my home. It turned into having to go to the police to ask them to, to ensure that they don't accidentally swap my home. Right. And have someone call in a violent attack at my home, which causes a police response that could be very de devastating, especially to someone who isn't white. 
Yeah. Right. There's a tendency to ask questions later and to shoot first. Pew, pew. Right. When you're right, when you're right. brown or black in America, that's just the reality. And so nobody wants to call the police if they don't have to. Right. And you certainly don't want them called to your home in the case of a false response. And so um, I had to I had to still do my job through all of that. And and if I could go back and take it back, I'd have to think about, you know, what could I have done better? What could I have done better to protect myself? Could I have. Could I have contacted the FBI ahead of time? You know, like yeah. there isn't really anything I could have done. And realistically, the people who could have protected me were Twitter and they didn't. Yeah. So I was at the campaign and I emailed from my campaign email address, joebiden.com. And I tried to ask their public policy people to help me. And they were very excited to help me at first, re responded very nicely, ready to go. And then they stopped responding. Yeah. And then the account which doxed me went down for two weeks, came back up two weeks later, and is still live and threatening me and posting crazy stuff. Yeah. You know, and there isn't anything that I can do about this. It's only something that Twitter can do about it. It was a policy decision that they made in order to allow someone who, you know, allegedly, I'm not sure if it was them or not, had emailed the campaign alleging that I was friends with a white supremacist. Yeah. And then that narrative made its way to the Washington Examiner, a far-right tabloid, where they picked it up, and then the Daily Wire did a story on me. So yeah. all anonymous sources, no corroboration, no, uh, like, there's just no evidence behind this that holds up in any way. But the reality is, in order for a SAB attack to be successful, it does not have to be correct. It doesn't have to be factual. It doesn't, you know what I'm saying? It, and if they can work one small basis of reality in there, then it legitimizes everything that they've said. So in the case of Hunter Biden, once it became clear that he is a drug addict, right, and and has been through, gosh, like the 12 step and has been through the entire rehab process, power to this man, because it is an incredibly difficult thing to do to cro to, to claw your way out of addiction. And I'm, I'm uh, proud of him for it, as I would be for anybody who accomplishes that. But it, it's just um, it's just shocking to me that someone who doesn't necessarily have a political nexus and that wasn't on the campaign working in a political capacity, it doesn't really matter. If it doesn't matter if you think you are or you aren't, you absolutely are. And that's something that I like to try to impress upon people who work in tech. If they work for a company that does harm, they are engaged in harm. And they may be pretty far down the sausage production process. But at some point, they were involved in making the sausage. And it's a very similar situation to the disinformation attack that came after me in uh, in 2020. So, yeah, I'm, I'm still reeling from that, honestly. I just still find it kind of bizarre and ridiculous that people really believed that about me. How could they believe that I'm actually friends with someone who's been attacking me for like 15 years? But the association is enough. Right. The association is enough. If if you if you tweet something at someone, you better be careful that you know exactly who that person is, because it can get dragged up 10, 15 years later when you're in the process of engaging in a campaign. And it can be a legitimate complaint or it can be a non-legitimate complaint. And the issue is when the topic of mis or disinfo comes up, folks are legitimately unaware to distinguish between correct and incorrect. A lot of times the facts have been so intentionally blurred that the goal is simply to get people to disengage with a topic, to form an opinion, and then to run away from the topic and never consider it again because their opinion has been formed. And so it's, uh, it's really uh, frustrating to see people fall for this again and again, because what happened to me is simply a template, which is applied to other people multiple times per year on a regular basis. I mean, we can see it happen ourselves. We see these smear campaigns happen. Yeah. And um and they go on they go on unabated. There isn't really a sense of, you know, how do we how do we get ahead of this kind of issue other than doing the political due diligence process, which is verifying the people who come to work for you when someone comes in the door and knocks on the door and says, "Hey, there's something off about your employee that I think is weird to certainly consider it as a potential case of insider threat because you, you can't not consider it, but also to think about how your adversary is intending to drive you to move. What does your adversary actually want you to do by passing you this information? Right, right. Well, I'm very sorry that happened to you, by the way. Thank I you. see your mentions and, 
you know, on, on Twitter. And I just think, oh, God, poor Jackie. <laughs> like, just any, like, the most innocent tweet. And just people just swarm. I see that all the time. Yeah. And yeah. you almost yeah. have to, you almost have to just live completely off the social media grid. Right? Because if you're a woman of color, if you're a brown woman, a black woman, and you want a powerful position that is in opposition to what your adversaries want, which I think you you are, right? They will find anything to use against you and it doesn't have to necessarily be credible. And you know, frankly, when I think about all of the the women of color, women generally, but black and brown women who have risen to really high levels of power, let's just take Katanji Brown Jackson, Justice Jackson. For example, I was really surprised that they they didn't try to find more. They didn't fabricate more. I was really happy that she ascended. But, you know, I mean, it's it's not guaranteed. If you haven't lived completely offline, it's it's definitely not guaranteed. So I can agree with that. I don't think I've ever even considered that <laughs> because because I think, yeah. I think that social needs are so important and core to who we are as human beings and so also essential to being somebody who cares about your community, to nurturing the people around you, to wanting to have a, a, a stake and a connectedness in what's going on. I think all of that is just part of being a connected and engaged citizen. I, I find it really a tough sell to recommend to anyone that they simply can't engage in technology if they want to stay safe. I think that's a really sad compromise yeah. that people shouldn't have yeah. to make. I mean, that's an extreme. But I, if I think about myself, because I'm thinking about my own behavior online, you know, as a black woman, and I, I can see ways now that I either consciously or subconsciously change the way I engage because I, I see what happens to your mentions. Yes, there's the chilling effect of surveillance, which we're all well aware of, right? Where in which you modify your behavior because you have the perception that you may be surveilled and then there's modifying your behavior because you're afraid to be harassed and i think that's a different type of social pressure than we had previously where you would have social pressure not to harass right exactly <laughs> right exactly. Um. so what's happened i think there have been so many behaviors that have become normalized as a result of engaging in these low policy environments where it seems like no one has the responsibility to help you. And if they do have the responsibility to help you, they don't actually help you and they leave you in the yeah. lurch. I mean, there are hundreds of thousands of people who have been literally hundreds of thousands. That's my estimate of people who have been harassed on social media. Yeah. Right. I would say that most teenagers can relate at least one story of harassment. They're actually the, I think Gen Z is actually the group most likely to be targeted online. Yeah. Um, for scams, for fraud and harassment. So I, I just despair about the world that we're that we're sending our kids into. My my kids are nine, uh, three and four. Yeah. My nine year old just wants all the likes. She wants likes. She's not allowed on social media. Okay, so she looks yeah. for ways to engage in social media without engaging in social media. So she's on like a Lego app for kids where she posts her Lego <laughs> photography, and anytime oh, she that's... gets <laughs> when she gets the likes, she's like, "This is the best thing that ever happened to me." Right? I love that for her. But I also am concerned that the feedback that people are getting is affecting their behavior in ways that we can't even begin to quantify today in 2024 and being yeah. a digital native like her even, even more so. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, one way that I can't necessarily see this and I, and you're an expert in this. So how does this all affect or how does this pose a national security risk? Mm. Well, the research I've been doing over the past year has been quite informative in terms of giving me a sense of what the hubs are of this activity. And, you know, like off of the major social media sites like Twitter and Facebook, there are forums that are essentially hubs of toxicity. You know, people just kind of flock to these forums, people who maybe have antisocial personality disorder, which is tied to psychopathy, right? Narcissistic personality disorder, um, lots of other <laughs> personality related disorders that I'm not qualified to diagnose. Uh, we have a huge mental health crisis in our country where it seems re really difficult to get help for anything that isn't depression. And even for depression, it's hard to get help, right? So... In these unmoderated spaces, we're seeing that 
the level of toxicity and lack of moderation is creating feedback loops and they're very negative to society. Like people who are school shooters, who are mass shooters have come out of these hate forums. And the way that these systems are supported is often by taking their servers and their server infrastructure and going to another jurisdiction, another country that is a lot less likely to impose any type of penalty for the speech in which they are engaged. So for example, it would be really difficult to host a hate site out of Germany because they're just not about it. They don't want to allow that type of speech. And so it would be banned rather rapidly because there is a culture of doing so, both at the corporate level and at the governmental level. And here in the United States, we sometimes see similar, although there are a handful of companies who espouse a quote unquote free speech imperative that prevents them from being able to remove any of their customers. They like to present themselves, in the case of the one company I'm thinking of, Cloudflare, they like to present themselves as a utility, as an internet utility that can't be turned off, lest rights violations occur, lest human rights be violated. But the reality is their sponsorship of websites that are so abhorrent that most service providers will not give them a home um, is a political statement in and of itself, you know? So I think that the, the, the fact that there are U.S. companies that are shielding some of these forums that have rushed to Russia in order to find successful hosting, I think that's really a huge crux of the problem is we're allowing material support of hatred that then ends up affecting our national security in ways that are more aligned with stochastic terror than that of a well-planned and funded operation, if that makes sense. But there is still funding associated with these because those network operators know who's on their network and they're making a conscious decision to maintain them on the network. And this isn't accidental, right? I mean, this sounds like there are lots of moving parts, but it sounds very deliberate, especially when you, when you mentioned Russia. Right. So you have these people who may or may not be struggling with mental health issues and that in the intersection of kind of this rise of normalizing right wing speech and thought, that intersection, then connecting that to these forums or these spaces that are kind of unpoliced, right, in unpoliced environments. Like that's a very dangerous combination. And Americans pay for that in things like mass shootings or, you know, mass terrorism. Is that, am I making those connections correctly? I think you are. I think you are. I, I made the connection at my recent keynote. I did a keynote presentation at a, a web application security conference in October of last year. And this was an atypical situation for me because normally the kinds of conversations I would be having with them would be much more technical and not about the human factors of cybersecurity. And it's a massive national security risk because what we're not doing is interrupting the path of radicalization. And I think in the past, you know, the, the government, right, let's say the FBI was much more habituated to smaller groups who, like, say, the KKK, right, the Klan. Those people were kind of localized to their, to their areas. You know, they're, they're people who you could keep a track on. You knew who they were. They had identities, right? Even if they were obscure identities within the clan, you could still pick up on who was what they would send undercover, right? A lot of people sent undercover investigators into the clan over the years, like any other group like that, Hell's Angels, right? What we're seeing today is a big question mark as to whether that kind of activity is actually occurring. Is undercover activity happening in these forums? And is it producing any outcomes worth writing about? Because the forums that I've been tracking have been engaged in outright hate for quite some time. And because they act as lightning rods for, for many different types of people who have problems, they're engaging in, in sharing tactics, right? So these swatting and doxing tactics that we're seeing around the United States, where these lax data privacy regulations are being used to enable the obtaining of personal information, the, the, the clarification is, does this person actually live here, right? That's what you need in order to conduct a successful swatting attack. And so I think, you know, getting closer to the election, I think we may see more of this, which is why I've been really fighting on Twitter and shouting for the for law enforcement, for the FBI to do something about this. And they just established a central swatting tracking capability last year, which I was really pleased to see. 
NBC reported this within connection uh, of a case that I'm working regarding these swatting attacks that have been targeting one particular individual. And it seems to me like things are going in the right direction because there is recognition in increasing, but that still doesn't get us closer to actually stopping the key source issues, which are private American companies making bad decisions intentionally or unintentionally regarding the platforming of certain actors, the lack of recognition at the cybersecurity level, both policy and professional, like commercial, that routes are being established, that route to sanctioned nations and systems that we shouldn't want to engage in mutual traffic with, and they're being done through intermediaries. There isn't enough investigation being done to understand who, who those network routes belong to, how they were established. Is it a legitimate company? Is that a company that has proven itself to be an enemy of the people? That information is available, right? Like FBI is collecting information. CIA collects information. NSA collects information. Our government has a ton of information and they have a ton of resources. And I know they must be collecting information on these threats. But what we're not seeing is the outcomes. Why aren't these platforms going away? Why are there several hundred Americans on a hate forum a small one I'm thinking about every day engaging in attacks, abuse, you know, what they would call protected First Amendment activity, but they're stochastically encouraging by posting phone numbers, email addresses, home addresses, uh, private documents, abuse of, of FOIA systems, Freedom of Information Act requests, where they reach out to courts or uh, any other government agency in order to obtain information which can then be used to further harass their target there isn't really anything being done about those you know and and sh you know my shouting at cloudflare on twitter about it maybe builds a little bit of a base of support for it but i don't really think it's actually effective but what is effective right what what could possibly be effective against these actors other than policy changes at the federal government I am curious as to the foreign actors and how they fit into this whole picture, right? And PSYOPs influence campaigns and if they're connected, obviously they're connected. But tell me about those because that's something that I know is happening, but I don't see any conversations about it, especially in mainstream media. I think that foreign actors have a role in encouraging and funding any domestic activity, which drives them closer to their goals. That's period, right? So any any country that that has an adversarial stance against another country is going to engage in the use of these influence tactics from here on out. I don't think that governments are turning away the digital tools at their disposal in order to engage in influence work. But what we're seeing is that the influence work that's being done by those well-heeled adversaries outside of the United States what we're seeing is that those are generally more effective than anything our government is doing if they are, because we have large swaths of the United States that are being turned against our government and being told that our government is fraudulent, that our elections are fraudulent, and that our president is fraudulent, right? And so we're in this environment where trust has been intentionally degraded bit by bit. And I think it's really impossible for any individual citizen to be able to say with certainty what is actually happening when they're engaging in a conversation with someone else. For example, I spoke with someone who I believe to be a large language model today. <laughs> you know, this is a person who is clearly using GPT, but are they are they doing it through the Twitter API? Are they pay, paying a million bucks a month or whatever Elon wants for the API in order to engage in that business? Because if so, that's fairly sinister. I mean, there are a limited number of actors across the world who can pay for access to the Twitter API firehose and that two-way programming interface that allows bots to run and to operate really freely. So I think that in the same vein as demanding that our elected leaders do the right thing, I think people need to start demanding that tech companies do the right thing. And that won't come to bear until we know more about what it is that they're actually doing, which they try very hard to keep from us. So uh, for example, Twitter used to publish information about 
some of the influence operations that they had detected over the past month. And they would release these figures every month. And obviously, these are cherry picked bits of information. The investigations that they felt comfortable bringing out publicly or that they thought would be of most value to academic researchers. And so I was in this program, which of course shut down as soon as Elon showed up. It is really a sad state of affairs that for applications and systems that are so critically important to us as, as humans, systems that we rely on every day, almost as much as we rely on a car or a plane to get us somewhere, we just don't have the safety in these tech systems that underpin the work that we do as human beings, you know, like it's, it's kind of distressing. I mean, it's very distressing. It's not kind of, I, I tend to, yeah. I tend to downplay things a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I get it. Yeah. <laughs> it's distressing. It's a hassle. It's awful. It's a bad state of affairs. And I wish that our electeds were technically evolved enough to be able to keep up with it or had the right folks recommending things or that if they were to improve their policy positions that they wouldn't get shouted out of the room by people who have funding from louder sources. That feels like an impossible problem to solve because, as you know, it's an entire profession in itself. You know, people do this for their entire careers to become as tech savvy as you are, right? To expect someone to be able to run a country and to be as tech savvy as they need is not going to happen. The second thing is that whenever I hear someone mention PSYOPs campaigns and foreign influence, there's always this kind of collective eye roll, like, oh my God, a conspiracy theory, you know? And I feel like that response in itself is a part of the campaign. <laughs> like we've been collectively influenced to not take these things very seriously. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Case in point is, is my friend, Jim Stewartson. So Jim talks about these issues that, that are psyops related that center around disgraced general Michael Flynn. And I've found it really illuminating to take a look at what he says, to evaluate the factual nature of those statements, and then to see how certain others, who are kind of the same people again and again, attempt to degrade that narrative, to reduce what he's said, to make statements about him, and to try to to downplay his message as much as possible. The goal is to get people to stop engaging with the conversation, even as Mike Flynn engages in discussion about how the American people are being psyoped. He doesn't want them to know about the larger picture of psyops. He wants them to know about the concept of psyops that he himself knows and wrote about in his book, 5G Warfare, 5GW Warfare. He wrote this with a former military guy who worked in a psyops group. And I've even seen, I've even seen an official U.S. Army account that focuses on psyops that's based near the old Fort Bragg, that has engaged in SAP-like discussion against Stewartson, which I find really fascinating. You know, I think there has been a convergence of threats like never before. There has been a unification of the global far right in a way that we only saw maybe once before, and I hope we never see again. And it doesn't seem like any one person is going to be able to pull us out of this mess. And a lot of people are waiting for like the one person who is like the new uh, Dr. King, who's like, you know what I mean? Like the, like the new person who is going to galvanize the people and bring them along to a collective vision. That's what everyone's waiting for. I don't think that hero is coming. I think that hero is each of us. And the more people that find their voice and are able to realize that they have the ability to make change, the better. I mean, that if, if technology can't do that for us, then it's really doing absolutely freaking nothing, right? I don't know if you read this, but there was a piece in the New York Times, I think it was last year or the year before, that showed that there was a serious psyops, a Russian-driven psyop campaign that diminished the reputation of people behind the Women's March, right? It was a big, big study, very serious academics behind it. Having that level of media coverage should not then be dismissed as being kind of nothing. Yeah, I think this stuff builds up. I think cultural awareness is a slow process. It's a lot slower than than most people who work in, in activism would want it to be. You know, if you're trying to change perceptions and you're trying to do it at a large scale, that's exactly what the psyopers are trying to do. And they're working overtime and putting a lot of money into making sure that we never even consider that, that if someone is presenting themselves as a, a Joe Bob in Ohio, 
who loves football and, you know, he goes out hunting every week and, you know, he, that's how he presents himself on Twitter. Like most of us are just going to believe that that's Joe Bob. Like we have no reason to believe otherwise. We just can't possibly grasp the machinations. And when you, when you try to present this to people, I've noticed that the cognitive dissonance, if they have indeed bought in to any conspiracy theory that's been affirmatively labeled as such by say academics, right? Widely, widely uh, understood amongst people <laughs> that this is a conspiracy theory. I find it really difficult to disengage people from that because the tactics that were used against them were effective against them. You know, like these are like the, 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 the mind virus that Elon's always talking about, you know, like that's really where we're at is there's an, there's a down is up and up is down version of reality that's being promoted to us. So very similar to Orwell's 1984, which I read when I was a young person was very formative for me and guiding my, my thought process. And it's the reason why I come out on the side of individual liberties so often up until the moment where they butt against my own liberties and my own freedom. Yeah. And I think we all as people need to agree on what the redefinitions of these concepts are in this new digital realm that we find ourselves in, because not only has the law not adapted, but our conception of ourselves with these laws in this new digital environment have not adapted. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, Jackie, I have kept you far too long. You're too <laughs> fun of a guest to talk to. Is there anything you want to tell us in, in closing for 2024? <laughs> hmm. I, I want to urge listeners of the of the Electorate podcast to be very mindful of headlines, inflammatory headlines, topics that are centering on the vices of another human being, stories that are salacious that are intended to create an impression of someone's character. I think you should look past those and think about, you know, what is the research that you can do on what that person has actually done, right? Don't, don't, um, don't buy into headlines hook, line, and sinker, and don't also let that make you think that every headline is a lie, because that certainly is not true. There are journalists working very, very hard who are very ethical in their professions, who try every day, I, I speak to them, they try very hard every day to ensure that the right thing comes out and that their stories are researched and that their reputations stay intact as journalists. And so I, I think that people just need to focus on not just the stories themselves and the subject of those stories and what have they done previously and does the story align, but more importantly, the journalist. What type of stories do they normally write? Do they have a bias? Do they have a slant um, that you can observe in their coverage? And maybe you can figure out what about their personal lives has driven them to that, but they're often told not to. They're not allowed to present their own viewpoint through their writing. They're only allowed to present facts and they do their best to present a viewpoint that helps draw the reader towards the conclusion that they want them to have. And so realize that every media shop is the same. Every organization that has a media mission is doing what they can to influence you and to try to shift your perception towards an understanding of the situation and the way they want you to have it. And that may be factual and that may be not. Certain organizations have a reputation of engaging in repeatedly non-factual behavior, you know? So it, it's important for you to check uh, PolitiFact, um, uh, Snopes, uh, do a little bit of fact checking, but that stuff can only come after we've been influenced. That's the frustrating part. You can't undo that influence as easily as you can to set it. So just do your best to try to be resistant and inoculated, almost like a vaccination to the type of disinformation that we've seen in 2016 and 2020, because 2024 is sure to be even more for us. They want us to disengage from being connected to our civic selves. Uh, they don't want us to vote. <laughs> they don't, they, they don't yeah. want us to talk about stuff. They don't want us to vote. They don't want us feeling good. They want us to feel yeah. bad every day. And so be really wary and mindful of attempts to cause you to think that all is lost, that there is no hope, that things are so bad they can't, you know, they can, they're not going to get better, that, you know, like all of those things are sappers mm -hmm. of your energy. And so get, get better at maybe identifying those sappers of your energy and try to stop them from latching on as soon as you can. That's a great, great way to end. Well, Jackie Singh, I've enjoyed talking to you so much. I could talk to you all day. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for all the work that you do. 
Thank you, Jen. I've appreciated this so much. It's been great. Uh, I would come back anytime. Thank you so much for having me.